بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Last Wednesday we had talked about the beginnings of the Battle of Badr and the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to verify from the Ansar whether they were willing to fight with the Prophet Sallallahu or not and uh, as we said that the Ansar at the leader of them Sa'd ibn Mu'adh he stood up he gave a beautiful speech and he committed to whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted them to do now when the Prophet Sallallahu saw these enthusiasms coming from the Sahaba he began the preparations for the war and now that the Ansar had committed so he could use their uh, their manpower if you like and so he divided up the group or the army into three uh, flanks if you like and he gave the primary flag the flag bearer and that flag was white in color and by the way the process had different flags in every battle so he didn't have one standard uh, flag rather it just so happened whatever was convenient at the time it appears that he didn't have uh, the standard flag sometimes he had white sometimes he had black uh, and sometimes he had uh, other colors as well uh, and so in this uh, battle the battle of Badr he gave the primary flag uh, to Mus'ab ibn Umair and Mus'ab ibn Umair, as we all know, he became a shaheed in this uh, uh, battle. Uh, so, uh, sorry, not in the battle of Uhud. He will become shaheed in the battle of Uhud. And uh, he gave the white flag to Mus'ab ibn Umair. And he then divided the rest of the Sahaba into two groups. On the right-hand side, he placed Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he gave him all of the Muhajirun. And on the left side, he placed Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, and he gave him all of the Ansar. According to one report, he actually had a backup group as well. Uh, and that was so therefore it's as if he's dividing his army into four groups again we're all trying to piece together what happened according to one report he had a backup group uh, maybe for reinforcements uh, maybe for another position in the battlefield and he placed them under the charge of Qais ibn uh, Sa'a -Sa. but the two primary groups one on the right and one on the left and there was of course the, the, the battalion that was going to charge the one on the right was Ali ibn Abi Talib and the one on the left was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and the one on the right was the Sa'a was the the, um, uh, Muhajirun and the one on the left was the Ansar. Now here in this division between the Muhajirun and the Ansar, we actually uh, learn that Islam takes into account cultural and ethnic divisions. In that the, Ans the, the Ansar were given one group and the Muhajirun were given another group. Why is this? Because every person is more familiar with his own ethnicity, his own people. The Muhajirun knew each other better and the Ansar knew each other better. And the Muhajirun felt more comfortable together because after all, they had lived together, they, have, they had uh, grown up together. And similarly, the Ansar, they also felt more comfortable together. And therefore, we learn from this that the attitude of some Muslims to ignore culture completely or to ignore any type of ethnic division, this is an extreme. Allah Azza wa Jal clearly says, we have made you uh, shu'ub and qaba'il. And shu'ub means large uh, large qabilas, if you like, the, the mother qabilas. It's translated as nations, but the concept of nation is a modern concept, as you know. Shu'ub means uh, basically maybe races or ethnicities. So one sha'ab is the Arab sha'ab, another sha'ab is the Indian sha'ab. So this is like shu'ub. And then qaba'il is the sub-tribes. Qaba'il is the actual tribe. This is Quraysh, this is Hudal, this is the uh, Banu Murrah. And so Allah is saying, I have made you all of these different ethnicities and different uh, tribes so that you may lita'araf, we'll get to know one another. In other words, uh, this is a tangent of the tafsir, if all of humanity had been the same, how would you stand out? If everybody was exactly the same, how would you stand out? So the fact that we have different faces, different looks, different tastes, different cultures, each one of us has a personal identity. Each one of us has a specific background, if you like. So the point being here that the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of this ethnic division basically by putting each group to itself. And there is no doubt that you just look around you that birds of a feather flock together. That people of a particular area will congregate, will socialize more than people from another area and there's nothing inherently un-Islamic about this as long as it's not taken to an extreme, right? And here we have this division of the Ansar and the uh, Muhajirun. Also notice that the Prophet ﷺ put in charge of them, both of the uh, leaders were young dynamic visionaries. Ali ibn Abi Talib on the one side and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh on the other. And both of them 
were of their noblemen, i.e. Ali is considered to be of the noble and Sa'd ibn Mu'adh as we know he was also considered to be of the future leader of the Ansar and once again there is this uh, pragmatism, there is this reality that you cannot deny that there are certain people in every community they are more respected than others, right? We have, some people have this utopic notion everybody is exactly the same, no they are not. Some people have qualities that set them apart from others. Some people have leadership. Some people have charisma. Some people have those qualities that make them respected amongst their peers. And the Prophet ﷺ did not choose a nobody. He did not choose a person unknown. He chose those people who would have had the respect of their respective ethnicities, right? Ali is the uh, great grandson of, of Abdul Muttalib. Ali is the cream of the, uh, the, the crop of the Quraysh. Uh, he is the young man coming up. So the Quraysh all admire and love him. His lineage, his father, everything is perfect. After all, his father is Abu Talib and he was the chieftain of the Banu Hashim. And of course, on the side of the Ansar, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, uh, he was going to become, as you know, the leader, if you like, uh, of the Ansar. Uh, had he not died, uh, his shaheed death, as we'll come to, inshallah, and his time in the Seerah. So once again, an element of pragmatism that we look to our community not everybody is respected the same and when you give positions of leadership you need to give it to those people who are respected in the community why this is a time of war you need you cannot have a person who, who whom others will say why are you put in charge of me what makes you better than me and again there is an element of uh, taking into account the differences of people also notice that the person who was chosen to be the flag bearer, and the flag bearer is in some of the flag bearer, of course, he is not the leader. The flag bearer is not the leader. The flag bearer is the one who positions the army. He is the central point, he is the focus, right? So he has an honorary position. And he chose somebody whom uh, both the Ansar and the Muhajirun could basically look up to, and that is Mus'ab ibn Umair. He is a Muhajir. So he is Qurashi. And yet he is the earliest of the people to immigrate to Medina. And therefore, the respect that he has amongst the Ansar is unparalleled. After all, most of the Ansar converted at his hands. And so Mus'ab ibn Umair is chosen. He was a Muhajir. He's a Qurashi. He's of the noblest and the richest families. And yet he's also converted most of the Ansar at his own hands. And therefore, he was the most Madani of the Muhajirun. He was the most madani of the muhajirun and hence the Prophet cho chose him to basically symbolize the entire army and nobody could have symbolized it better than this muhajir who is also a madani who is the one who at whom hands the Ansar have converted. And again this shows us the wisdom of the Prophet and of course it's a very honorable position but it's also a dangerous position because the flag bearer is always the target of the enemy. The enemy wants the flag to fall. It's a symbol. If the flag ever falls, even if it's picked up again, it's a symbol that when the uh, uh, when the other uh, army sees the flag fall, it encourages them. It gives them uh, hope. It gives them more power to f attack. So the flag should never fall. Never. And therefore the flag bearer is always the center of attack. And another problem is the flag bearer is always uh, impaired because he has one hand holding the flag. And so he cannot fight to the same level as those who are not holding the flag. And so the flag bearer has a very important role. Of course, one of the main purposes of the flag bearer during any particular battle. And remember, this is the good old days. You're fighting one man to one man. Not like uh, the modern armies where you never see your enemy. Right? The good old days, you literally are in the thick of things. Right? So you will get disoriented. You will turn around. You will do this and that. And the purpose of the two flag is to always have a marker that where are you, which side is the enemy, which side is your, uh, is your own army. So the purpose of the flag has all of these matters. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ arrived, he was the first of the two to arrive. He preceded the uh, Quraysh by a day. So he came to the plains of Badr on the 16th of Ramadan. And this is of course in the second year of the Hijrah, on the 16th of Ramadan, in the second year of the Hijrah. And the Prophet ﷺ immediately set up his uh, camp and his tents basically on the outskirts of the entire plains of Badr. And inshallah, I keep on saying next week we'll have the maps, but I'm waiting to finish all of the, the, the documentary basically, the, the talk basically, and then inshallah we'll show you the maps uh, on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, Dr. Bashar has done a great job of compiling maps and, and uh, drawing the whole uh, diagram. So once we summarize it all, then inshallah, one day uh, when we finish all of that, we'll just summarize it again through those uh, diagrams. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ camped on the 16th 
16th of Ramadan on the outskirts of the uh, plains of Badr. And before he had set up camp, Al-Hubab ibn al-Munzir, who was a scout, he was well known for being a person who went into the desert long periods of time. He was somebody known for traveling. Al-Hubab ibn al-Munzir came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, this place that you have decided uh, for us to camp, is this something Allah has told you to do? Such that we are not allowed to move one inch forward or backward? Or is it your own opinion and it is based on tactics and strategies of war? Why are you camping here? And so the Prophet said, no, this is my own opinion, it's basically my strategy. And so the Prophet, he said, in that case, Ya Rasulullah, I suggest we don't camp at the corner of the plain, rather we should proceed until we're beyond midpoint. And therefore the wells of Badr are behind us. And in this case, he said, we shall have plenty of water and they will have to rely on their jugs and their canisters that they've come from Mecca. And of course that's a big demoralizing factor, right? We have the water for them, it's a big demoralizing factor. They have no access to water. And they will have to, they know that their, their water will run out, they're going to have to go back after uh, a period of time. And so uh, in one version, Jibreel came to him and said, follow the advice of Hubab. And so the Prophet ﷺ then followed the advice of Hubab and he said, you have directed us to the better uh, opinion. And therefore he then uh, did not camp there, he proceeded onwards until they had, uh, it, it appears to be there are multiple wells. There was one major well and there, there were small multiple wells. And to this day if you go to Badr you will still find there's one major well and then there's smaller wells away. So he put all of the wells behind him and just to be on the safe side, he blocked the smaller wells after taking the water out and pouring it into the big one. Right. So just in case they go to a farther well on another side of the plain, all of those were blocked off. All of those were filled. And the big well that was the main one, the other waters were taken out, pulled out by canister and thrown into the large one so that it was in the center of the Muslim camp and the Quraysh had no access to any, uh, uh, any water. Now this incident uh, is just one of dozens of examples in which the Prophet ﷺ would regularly take advice from the companions and sometimes even change his mind and act upon it. And the concept of shura is sh shown over and over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ was never like the modern dictators. It was never like my opinion must go. Rather, he would always take the opinions of the Sahaba. And in this incident, uh, Al-Hubab also demonstrates that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, sometimes, now this is a very deep Usul al-Fiqh issue, and uh, it was worthy of a lot of discussion in Usul al-Fiqh, but not in the Seerah. The question is, did the Prophet Sallallahu sometimes do things from his own opinion, not from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? And this incident, of course, suggests that he did that sometimes his opinions were from himself. And uh, perhaps those opinions uh, might have had other interpretations that some would say are better in, in some circumstances, such as in this case of Al-Hubab. Now this is true, there's not a problem to say that, uh, but the problem comes that some people take this exception and try to make a rule out of it. Some people say that, look, this was the personal opinion of the Prophet ﷺ, therefore, we can go through the whole sunnah and pick and choose basically what was a personal opinion that he used to do and what was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Now this is wrong for many reasons. Firstly, we need to understand you cannot extrapolate the incident of Badr into Sharia. The incident of Badr is a particular strategy of war. You cannot say when the Prophet told you pray that oh this is his opinion. Give zakah, oh this is his opinion. The sharia ah is what he's commanding you to do. And where he's camping at Badr, there is not necessarily anything to be derived from sharia. Ah. Badr is only going to take place once. We don't do Badr every year, we go and do Badr and camp at the same place. He is not, basically what I'm trying to say is, when he camps at Badr, he is not intending to legislate a position of where to camp at Badr. You see the point here, right? Whereas when he prays, when he fasts, when he orders commandments for the Muslims of Medina, do this, don't do that, inheritance, laws, hijab, divorce, marriage, all of these laws, this is sharia. Ah, right? And he intends for the Muslims to follow him. And therefore we cannot equate one time incident of Badr with the rest of the sharia. Ah, right? Another point is that Hubab had to ask him point blank. 
Hubab didn't assume that he can understand which one is which. He asked him point blank, Ya Rasulullah, is this from Allah's wahi or is it from your ijtihad? Right? Who amongst us now can do this to the sunnah? Nobody can do this anymore. Right? And the basic rule is that whatever the Prophet said and did, it is his uh, sharia. Uh, by the way, so there are a number of occasions, very few, where sometimes once again the Sahaba asked the Prophet specifically, is this something you're commanding or is this just a suggestion? By the way, this is very rare. Usually, and there are literally, literally, no exaggeration, dozens of examples, dozens of examples. Usually, when the Sahaba heard something, they would apply it so literally, they would apply it so literally, it sometimes borders on the unimaginable. Like, how is this possible even, right? Uh, so there's two incidents, uh, both of which literally have the same almost story, and that once that the Prophet ﷺ was uh, in his tent, and uh, one of the Sahaba was outside, and it had, there had been a command, this was in one of the expeditions, that nobody should enter the tent. And this Sahabi had a pressing need. And so he asked the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, may I enter uh, the tent, I need to speak to you. So the Prophet said, yes. So then he remembered the commandment, you're not supposed to enter. Then he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I enter with my whole body or just part of my body? And he's so confused now, like, what is, are you telling me to just put my head in the tent, right? Or are you telling me to physically step in? So he has to verify. Right. Another instance of this nature is once the Prophet was uh, 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 giving the khutbah, uh, and during the khutbah he mentioned to somebody to uh, stop. And there was a sahabi coming into the door, and he didn't see the context of that word stop. Right. So he literally stopped mid-door with a foot up, stop. And he just stopped right there. Like he heard stop, khalas, no questions asked. Stop, right? Another, and we can go on and on. Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Khaybar, right? That the Prophet ﷺ told him that he gave him the, 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 the standard. And he said, go forth and do not come back, right? Imdi, and he go forth and do not come back. And go and, 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 and fight them in the name of Allah subhanahu wa And he gave them all of the command what to do. Ali walked 10 spaces. Then he had a question. He was about to turn around. But then he realized the Prophet said basically don't come back until you're victor victorious, right? So he shouted out loud, Ya Rasulullah, because he didn't want to turn around. Ya Rasulullah, what should I tell them when I am surrounding? Like what are the conditions you want me to get? The point being, he was being so literal here that he doesn't even turn around because the Prophet said don't come back till you're victorious. So he didn't want to turn his back until he was victorious, right? So the point being, we have hundreds of examples like this, but we have one or two where there's an overriding reason why one of the Sahaba asks, is this wahi from Allah or is this just a suggestion, right? So this is one of them. And then of course there's a famous uh, uh, incident which is somewhat uh, uh, humorous as well. And that is the incident of uh, uh, Barira. The incident of Barira. Uh, that uh, Barira is a long story, but uh, the, the, the short of it is that she was a slave and she was married to uh, a slave and uh, she was freed. And in Islamic fiqh, when the, the slave is freed and he, he or she has a marriage, it is up to them whether they want to continue the marriage or not. It's up to them. They can then annul the marriage. So now that Barira becomes free, she has the right does she want to remain married to a slave or not? She can, uh, without his permission, because now she has the right to do this. She can annul the marriage. Fasq is called, right? She can annul the marriage. So she decides to annul, annul the uh, marriage. Uh, and so her husband uh, begs and pleads her, and her husband literally is crying with her. That, oh, Barira, please take me back. You know, we can make it work out. Come on, please. You know, let's, uh, let's do something. And let's uh, uh, think of all the good old times. He's basically begging her to take him back. And Barira would not even look back at him. لا يلتفت إليه. She's li literally not even giving him the pleasure of her look, right? And they're going around the city. And he is crying. Ibn Abbas says, I saw, uh, Mughith was his name. Mughith was the husband's name. I saw Mughith's beard was wet with his tears. And he's crying out, Oh Barira, Oh Barira. And Barira would not even give him her look. Right? She's not even looking at him. And so the Prophet ﷺ saw the two of them walking around Medina like this. And so he felt mercy for Mughith, even though he's a slave. But the Prophet ﷺ is Rahma lil Alameen. He felt mercy for Mughith. And he said to Barira, Ya Barira, why don't you take him back? I mean, come on, you know this poor guy and he's crying, he's begging, why don't you take him back? And obviously Barira has no desire to take him back because all of this has taken place. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, ata'muruni? 
Are you commanding me? In which case, okay. Or are you just like, you know, suggesting, right? So the Prophet said, La inna ma ana shafi. I'm just, you know, reconciling. Ana shafi, right? So then she said, with only the scorn that a woman can possibly muster, La haja li fi. That I have no need of him. I have no need of him. Uh, and so uh, the point being that Barira asked, Ya Rasulullah, are you commanding me or not? And he said, no, I'm not commanding you. And this shows us that once again. Now, you know, the Prophet is being merciful that there's no way that uh, a marriage will last if uh, one of them, you know, is so much antagonistic towards the other. So he said, no, I'm not commanding you. So once again, Barira is verifying, is this Amr or is this just a suggestion? My point being, you can literally count these types of incidents on the fingers of one hand. In fact, some people say these are the only two incidents uh, in the whole seerah in, of this mention where somebody actually says, is this Amr or not? Right? And there might be one or two more, but they are literally within the fingers of one hand. So, for those, and of course the people who do this are those who wish to basically change the Sharia and say uh, that the Prophet did not command any laws that are of a legal nature. That's his opinion. We don't have to follow them. What we follow is uh, theology. What we follow is ritual, salah and zakah. Don't tell us hudud, don't tell us marriage and divorce, don't tell us interest and financial transaction. That's his personal opinion. And they base this from this one incident of uh, uh, one incident of al-hubab, and this is wallahi extremism. You're going to take this one incident and ignore the whole seerah. In any case, I needed to say that because this incident is misused. Uh, so, as we said, they went forward and they put the water in one well and they set up uh, a, a small type of camp. And this was when Saad ibn Mu'ad suggested, Ya Rasulullah, why don't we make for you a uh, a special khayma, a special headquarters where you can monitor the battle from. Uh, and so the Prophet agreed to this. So they chose an area where he could see the battle, probably a little bit of a hill or something, where he could uh, see the battle. And it was somewhat of a, uh, a mu'askar, or if you like, the, the headquarters. They built a headquarters for him on the plains of uh, Badr. And uh, the Sahaba then uh, set up uh, um, not tents. They were not going to have tents. They're living there for one night. But they, you know, they 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 made their camels sit down and they set up their sleeping bags and everything. And uh, night fell, and the Quraysh were on the horizon, so they could see that the Quraysh are coming in. There is not going to be a battle tonight. The battle is going to be the next morning. So night fell, and it is known that the battle is going to take place tomorrow morning. And it is narrated in the Musnad Imam Ahmad that the Prophet وسلم, spent the whole night awake making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making prolonged sajda. And he said in his dua that, Oh Allah, if you destroy this group in tahlika hadhihi al-usaba, if you destroy this group, falan tu'bada fil ard. You are not going to be worshipped on earth. In other words, if we fail, then I am the final prophet. And if I fail now, there's not going to be any more prophet after me. Oh Allah, if you don't help us now, then you will not be worshipped on earth. And in the middle of the night, the rain began to fall. Not a, a downpour, but just a dripple, just a drizzle. Light rain began to fall, and the people had to take their belongings and run helter-skelter to shelter themselves from the rain under the trees, under the shrubs, in, uh, maybe even in the, in the shade of their camels. They just had to make some type of covering to shelter them from the uh, rain. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ continued to pray and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until finally the dawn broke. And he was the one who said that, uh, O oh people, as salah, O oh people, as salah. So he woke them up for uh, Salat al Fajr and thus began the 17th uh, of Ramadan, the 17th of Ramadan in the second year of the Hijrah. According to some modern historians, this is uh, March 17th, 624 CE. March 17th, 624 CE. And it appears that this occurred on a Friday. It appears this occurred on a Friday. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran both the rain and the sleep. Allah mentions the rain and the sleep as being miracles from Him. And this is in Surah, uh, which Surah is about Badr? I said this many times. Surah Al-Anfal. Right, it's basically all of Anfal is about Badr. From the beginning to the end is basically a reference to Badr. And Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ nuas When sleep overcame you, when you became drowsy, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ nuas أَمَنَةً مِّنْهُ This was a, uh, a blessing and a peace and a security from Him. Right? وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And He sent down for you from the skies rain. 
لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ To purify you. So there was a physical uh, benefit as well. That you are dirty, you are disheveled, you're tired, the rain will cleanse you. It's like a fresh bath. يُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجِزَ الشَّيْطَانِ And there was a spiritual bath, physical bath and a spiritual bath, that the ridge or the filth of shaitan will be wiped away. And then there's another benefit, three benefits. وَلِيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ And to make your uh, footsteps firm. So when it rains just a little bit, so when there's no rain, the desert sand is very difficult to walk in. It's literally, as you, many of you know this, like you put your sand in it, you feed it and it goes down. You put your feet in it and it goes down. You, so, no rain is difficult to walk. A lot of rain is impossible to walk. It will become muddy. Just the right amount of rain will make it firm like the uh, cement if you like. Just the right amount of rain, it will make it firm. And Allah caused their side of the field to become firm. And Allah Azza wa made their side of the field firm to the footsteps. لِيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ To make the qadam, to make the footsteps very firm. And uh, uh, it is reported, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, this is Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if you could only have seen us on the night of Badr, if only you were there to see us on the night of Badr, every one of us was dead asleep. Except for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was praying uh, behind a tree and he was making dua until morning. And of course this is a miracle because the night before anything we're so nervous we cannot sleep. The night before any major exam, any major test, how about a major battle? How are you going to go to sleep? But Allah said, I was the one who caused you to become drowsy. Why? Because sleep makes you fresh, sleep makes you firm, sleep makes you powerful. And so Allah blessed them with sleep. Can you imagine in the Quraysh side, they didn't get the rain, they didn't get the sleep, so automatically Allah is blessing the Muslims in so many different ways. And again, we know, إِنْ يَنْصُرْكُمُ اللَّهُ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ If Allah helps you, then there is none who can uh, overcome you. And um, uh, it is also said, even though I have not found an authentic isnad, but it is found in some books that uh, the Quraysh side, they received a downpour of rain. And of course, this is the worst because it makes the ground muddy. And when the ground is muddy, then you cannot do anything. So the Quraysh side, they got the bulk of the rain, and the Muslim side, they got the perfect amount of uh, rain. Uh, it, this also shows us the concern of the Prophet wasallam that even though he is the Prophet of Allah, and even though he puts his trust in Allah, still, what can he do as a leader? He is concerned for his people. So the whole night he spends making dua to Allah, making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging and pleading Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, uh, Ibn Mas'ud says, Ibn Mas'ud says, uh, reported in uh, Tabarani, that I have never seen anyone pleading in my whole life, he said, I've never seen anyone pleading more than the Prophet was pleading on the night of Badr. So Ibn Mas'ud is saying the amount of pleading and begging throughout the whole night. He said, I've never seen anybody pleading that type of, of, of pleading uh, other than the Prophet Wasallam on the uh, night of Badr. And the question arises, did he go to sleep at all? And there's a little bit of a discussion amongst Ibn Kathir and others. Did he go to sleep at all? Ibn Kathir says he did doze off. He did doze off. And it was in this dozing off that Allah showed him the dream. What dream is this? It is referenced in the Quran. It is referenced in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ يُرِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنَامِكَ قَلِيلًا Again, Surah Al-Anfa. That Allah showed them to you, them meaning the Quraysh, to you, as being very small in number. You saw their army as being very small. وَلَوْ أَرَاكَهُمْ كَثِيرًا If he had showed them to you كَثِير as much as they were لَفَشِلْتُمْ وَلَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ You would have despaired and you would have began differing with, e with each other. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ سَلَّمْ But Allah protected you. Allah protected you by not showing you the real quantity, by giving you a boost of confidence. Now, not showing the real quantity, uh, this is not misinformation. Because if there are a hundred people and you see ten of them, these are ten. They're not, there's ten out of the hundred. If Allah were to have shown a hundred and fifty, this is incorrect information. 
right? Allah showing some of the people and not all, there is nothing incorrect over here because Allah never does anything incorrectly. Allah says, Woman astaghfirullah Allah haditha, who speaks the truer than Allah? So Allah Azawajal did not tell the Prophet, you're seeing the whole army. Rather, He showed him a dream. And the dreams of the Prophets are true. And so the Prophet saw a section of the army. And this section is a correct and valid and true section. So when the Prophet woke up, he felt a surge of confidence, right? And that was the goal of the, to give him that comfort. To give him that search. Allah knows he's going to be victorious. So before the victory, he's made feeling optimist. Uh, the, the optimism is there. And this is of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah azza wa jalla showed him uh, their quantity to be fewer than they actually were. And as the uh, sun rose up and they have prayed uh, Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet is now starting to align the Muslim army, and he did a tactic that was never done before amongst the Arabs. This tactic that we all know of, but amongst the Arabs, they did not have this tactic. The Arabs of old, they had the tactic of Al-Farru wal Kar. Al-Farru wal Kar. And Al-Farru wal Kar, the best way to describe this is, you can just imagine, uh, they, they, they do an a, a attack, basically in circles if you like, right? They go out and they attack the army, and then they come back and they recuperate. And then they go out and they attack and they come back and they recuperate. Al-Farru wal Kar means they go in batches and they come back. And they go in batches and they come back. This is Al-Farru wal Kar. The tactic of the Prophet is the modern tactic that we are all used to, and that is military battalions marching in rows. All of them in rows. And Allah Azza wa Jal references this uh, in the Quran. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-ladhin yuqatiluna fi sabilihi saffan ka'annahum bunyanu marsus. Of course, uh, modern military maneuvers, we all know that that is the most effective way. That you have rows upon rows, literally, and all modern uh, you know, armies, what do they do? They learn to march in rows. This tactic was not known to the Arabs. This was not practiced by the Arabs. But Allah Azza wa Jal taught our Prophet some this tactic, and this is now the standard tactic of all armies in the world, and that is to have ranks and rows and files. The entire army should be in rows. And of course, now in, in, in the Battle of Badr, they didn't have all of these weapons. Uh, they only had some of them. But of course, eventually what, what, what should be done is that the front row is going to have the javelins and the spears. And the back row is going to have the bow and arrow. And then the middles are going to have the swords, right? Now, in the Battle of Badr, they had some of these weapons, but not enough to really form a proper battalion. Nonetheless, they did what they could. And that is to have the, the, those who had spears were right in the front, and the people with the, the swords were the bulk, and everybody had a sword. Swords were what you all had. Uh, and then, uh, bow, they had a few bows and arrows, and so the bows and arrows were put at the back, and that is, of course, all of this, the Prophet did not go through any military school. But it's something that Allah Azza wa Jal just blessed him with, this intuition of, of how to arrange the army. Uh, and... This, of course, worked out for the betterment of the Muslims. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ was walking between the rows, straightening them like he straightens the rows for salah. Like literally having them in absolute straight lines. Again, I pause here. This is exactly what modern armies do, where they teach their soldiers, their infantry, to march such that psychologically they're marching Yani literally, bunyanu marsus. Literally, like Allah says, bunyanu marsus. And this is something, amazingly, the Prophet had never seen this. He had never experienced this. But it is something that, because he is Rasulullah SAW, it is simply coming to him. So he's marching between the, the rows and the ranks. And he had a stick that he was tapping people to make them completely straight. And there was a uh, Sahabi there who's, uh, who was standing in front of the line. He wasn't standing in the line. He was incorrect in his position. And so, and his name was Suwad. And so the Prophet ﷺ poked him in the stomach and he said, O oh Suwad, go get your place in line. Go straighten your line. Straighten up, O oh Suwad. So was Sufuf. Have the line straight. And he pokes him with the, with the uh, uh, stick. Uh, Suwad says, Ya Rasulullah, you have poked me and caused pain without any cause. In other words, I didn't deserve this pain. And Allah has sent you with truth and justice. So I demand justice. <laughs> Allah has sent you with truth and justice. So I demand justice. And I need to do this basically to you as well. Can you imagine they're about to have a battle? Can you imagine? And the Prophet did not, like he's literally just poking him. I mean, come on. 
You know, it's just a poke. It's not like he's putting a sword or something. It's just get your place in line. And Suwad says, I demand justice. Can you imagine any other general, right, who would have spoken to him in this manner? Can you imagine any other person? What would they have done if a private, if an infantryman speaks in this fashion? Immediately the Prophet ﷺ drops the stick, raises his shirt, drops it so you can pick it up, raises his shirt and says, here's Qisas. Your turn. Here's Qisas. Instantaneously he does this. Can you imagine like, Wallahi, it's the battle of Badr, you're going to be fighting the Quraysh, you're going to... But the Prophet ﷺ basically said, you have a point basically, you know, that okay, I caused you some pain, cause me the pain back. Here's the, uh, you may do Qisas. And uh, Suad immediately uh, bowed down and hugged and kissed the skin of the Prophet that was exposed. He kissed his stomach and he hugged it. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, what is this, O Suad? You're supposed to have poked me. What is this, O Suad? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, you see the situation we're in. You see the situation we're in. And so if we die, if I die, I wish that my last breath or my last time be that my skin touch your skin before my death, right? Of course, he didn't die in that battle, but the point being, now this is also a genius here, right? Look at how he's thinking that when the Prophet ﷺ pokes him instantaneously, he thinks of a plot, basically, to kiss the Prophet ﷺ, to hug the Prophet ﷺ. How else is he going to do this? So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him and uh, asked Allah Azza wa Jal to bless him. And again, yeah, and again, this obvious here, I mean, the ideal uh, role model that was set by the Prophet ﷺ in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to rights and privileges and wrongs and dhulm, everybody is the same. Kings and the peasant, they are all under the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ was so literal. He said, you know, yes, you're right. I shouldn't have poked you without any reason. That you caused pain. And what is this pain? What is the poke? I mean, Wallah, you do this, we do much more to our kids and our loved ones every day, right? But the Prophet ﷺ said, you're right. And instantaneously he raised his shirt and this shows us his humility, his humbleness. Uh, it shows us that this is why our religion led the world for as long as it did. That the leader and the led, the ruler and those who were ruled, they were all equivalent in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all know of the famous stories where sometimes even the Khalifa, and when he went to the court, he was judged as being wrong. And the famous story of the Jew and Ali ibn Abi Talib, where uh, when Ali was taken to court, the judge ruled against him. Right? And Ali accepted that judgment and the Jew immediately accepted Islam and he said, the, this religion that causes a judge to judge against the Khalifa has to be the religion of truth. And this is why Islam was what it was once upon uh, a time. Uh, nonetheless, so the Prophet made dua for Suwad and uh, continue, uh, continued to go down and making the rows uh, straight. As the sun is rising and finally the two armies can see one another, so we can say this is probably around 7, 7.30 in the morning, the sun is just about rising here. The Prophet ﷺ saw a man hastily running back and forth, uh, not running, uh, galloping on his camel in the lines of the Quraysh. Galloping back and forth in the lines of the Quraysh. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if there is any good in the Quraysh, it is in that person. And if they have any good in them, they shall listen to him. In another version he said, if they listen to him, they shall be successful. They shall be good if they listen to him. And he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, that, O oh Ali, call out to Hamza. Hamza was standing right in the front. Call out to Hamza and tell me who is that man and what is he saying. So Allah gave him wahi that that man is saying something good. But he didn't tell him what. So he told Ali to ask Hamza. So Ali went and marched forward and, and asked Hamza uh, to find out who is that man and what is he saying. So we infer from this that Allah told him that the man has some wise uh, words. Uh, and so the Prophet said, if they listen to him, they shall be good. Uh, and who was this man and what does he say? We'll talk about inshallah uh, in a while. Um, also when the Prophet saw the Quraysh, once again he began to raise his hands to Allah and making dua to Allah against the Quraysh. And he said, Oh Allah, this is the Quraysh. They have come against you with their pride and their arrogance, challenging you and rejecting your messenger. Oh Allah, 
your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, your help that has been promised. I.e., I want your help that has been promised. Oh Allah, cause them to be destroyed today. So he continues to make dua even until the very last uh, minute. Let's pause here, go to the side of the Quraysh now. So there's two things happening at the same time. So let's pause here, go to the side of the Quraysh, then come back to the side of the Muslims. On the morning of the 17th, as the two armies are facing one another, the Quraysh has come late last night, so they don't really know who they're facing, meaning the size, the quantity. Right? They're still uncertain. And so they send, right after Fajr most likely, when the sun is, or maybe even at dawn, we don't know an exact time, but before the armies began to meet, they send their most experienced scout. His name is Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jumahi. Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jumahi. They send their most experienced scout to go find out how large is the army of the Muslims. And so Umayr goes far and wide, maybe even circles around, but he goes around the plains of Badr alone to get an estimation of how large the Muslims are. And when he came back, he told the Quraysh, they are around 300, that's pretty precise. They're around 300 plus or minus some. But I feel that this is a huge catastrophe about to happen. They didn't ask his opinion, but he's offering his opinion. I feel there's a huge catastrophe about to happen. Young men of Yathrib, charged, eager, enthusiastic, young men of Yathrib, waiting to inflict death. A group of people who have no help other than their swords. They don't have armor. They don't have battalions. They don't have too many spears. They don't have too many javelins. They don't have too many bows and arrows. They literally came as an expedition with their swords. They're not armed to the hilt. And so when you're not armed and you're facing an enemy, what does that cause you? Desperation. It causes you to fight much more than you would fight otherwise. So he's saying, I'm seeing these young men and they only have their swords. They're going to be very desperate by Allah. I don't think that you will be able to kill anyone amongst them until they kill at least one of you. You're not going to kill anyone unless they kill one first amongst you. And if 300 of you die, then what pleasure will you gain for, for, for winning? If one third of you die, what's the point of this battle? Now do as you please. So uh, Umair gave him his advice. And it was an honest assessment that the, that the Muslims did not have weaponry, they didn't have horses, they didn't have armor, they only had their fighting swords, but they had a determination that you guys don't have. I sense in them fear, uh, not fear, sorry. I sense in them, uh, what's, a, what's a good word here? Bravery, not fear. I sense in them determination, is a good word here. I sense in them determination that even if you kill them, they will kill an equivalent number of you. 300 of you will die before you're able to get them. So what's the point of returning back to Mecca when your brother, your cousin, your father, when one of you is going to be dead, one out of every three of you will be uh, dead. And uh, Abu Jahl said, we didn't ask for your advice. We just wanted the quantity. We didn't ask for your advice. Who are you to tell us what to do? Uh, another person who's strongly opposed to the war. So now that they're actually facing the army, still there are people who don't want to fight. We have already mentioned in our last lesson that more than one third of the Quraysh has already returned. Right? When they found out that the caravan of Abu Sufyan was safe, more than 300 uh, people returned of different tribes. So there's already a, a, a dispute. We already mentioned that Umayyah, Utbah, they didn't want to go. That Abu Jahl had enticed them and said, look, let's just camp at Badr and sing for three days and get drunk for three days and let the people hear that we're not scared of anybody. So there's talk of war, but there's still hope there's not going to be a battle. That's the uh, position right now. Another person, therefore, who's stopping the battle is Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam, his son was a Sahabi and his son was on the other side, Hizam ibn Hakim. So don't get confused. Hakim ibn Hizam. So the Sahabi is Hizam ibn Hakim ibn Hizam. So the father, grandfather, sorry, the son and the grandson are, men, are the same name. So don't get confused. The father is on this side, the son is on that side. Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam did not want war as well. And he went to Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah who has been not wanting war from day one. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah who has basically tried his best that the Quraysh never fight. And Utbah who has been grudgingly coming to the army. He did not want to be here. 
And so he goes to Utbah. Why does he go to Utbah? Because he knows Utbah is not eager for war. And so he goes to Utbah and he encourages him to mediate a truce. How can you uh, make sure there's no battle today? And so Hakim asks Utbah that why don't you take on the blood money of the uh, Hadrami, Amr al Hadrami, pause here. Amr al Hadrami, he was killed in the Sariyat al Nakhla, if you remember. He was killed in the Shahr al Haram, right? Ashur al Haram, Yasalunak Shahr al Ami, Qital in Fi. Remember that Sariyah where six of the Sahaba, they didn't know what to do, and then they decided to launch an offensive. One person was killed. This is al Hadrami. And they were, uh, his name is uh, Amr al Hadrami. And they were hyping this up a lot. And they were saying, these are the people who killed Al-Hadrami. And we have to revenge the blood of Hadrami. And they attacked Al-Hadrami in the Haram, during the Haram, in the area of the Haram. Right? So they're making a big deal. Wallahi, we find the same types of sloganeering to this day. That these are the people who did this and who did that. And they don't see what they themselves have done. The same type of one-sidedness. Right? Always we see this. So the Quraysh are doing the same thing. These are the people who have killed Al-Hadrami. And they're making a very big deal of Al-Hadrami. So there's blood now in the air. People want revenge revenge for Hadrami. Like we have to defend our wounded and our fallen. We hear the same cry to this day. No matter what it means, we have to defend Al-Hadrami's honor. Uh, even though maybe before this Hadrami might be unknown, right? But still, now he becomes a, a, a hero. So, um, Rutba said that, okay, Rutba is a rich man, he's a noble man. Rutba said, okay, fine. If this is what's going to prevent bloodshed, I shall pay the blood money of the Hadrami. I will give it from my own pocket. That's a lot of money. Right? I will give the blood money. You all know blood money. We don't have to go over blood money. Huh? When somebody is killed or dies, you, play, you pay blood money. And blood money is supposed to be given by those who killed. But then if somebody else gives it for peace, this was accepted by Islam and by the Quraysh before. This was accepted. For peace, if you give the blood money, then you're not supposed to fight. So uh, Utbah says, I will give the blood money. And he made a speech to the relatives of Al-Hadrami, the extended relatives of Al-Hadrami, saying that, look, I will give the blood money, stop chanting his name basically. Stop making him to be the cause. Uh, however, when uh, the news of this reached uh, Abu Jahl, he flipped out basically. He flipped out. Before we reached Abu Jahl, I forgot. So, uh, Hizam, uh, Hizam, sorry, Hakim ibn Hizam, I'm getting confused. Hakim himself said, take the advice of this man. Take the advice of this man. And it was at this time when Utbah said, if somebody accuses you of cowardice, this is when he said this now, if somebody accuses you of cowardice, then mention my name and tell them that Utbah became a coward. Utbah became a coward. That you wanted to fight and I was the one, now Utbah's leader, he's the elder, he's a senior, and he said, I was the one who became scared, go ahead and say that. As long as it's going to avoid uh, bloodshed. Uh, even though you know he has to defend his honor, even though you know I'm not a coward. He's not a coward. Everybody knows he's not a coward. But he says, if somebody then blames you, you were cowards for not fighting, mention my name and say, you weren't cowards, I became cowardly and you didn't fight because of me. For by Allah, what will you gain by fighting this man? If you're able to defeat him, you will be killing your own father, your own cousin, your own nephew, your own blood. And again, this was unprecedented in Arabia. Never did one tribe kill a member of their own tribe. This is the gang mentality. How would you like it, he said? How would you like it that you are amongst the murderers of your own nephews and uncles and sons? Meaning, even if you don't kill him, somebody in your side of the army will kill your father, will kill your son, will kill your, your brother. How will you like it to see somebody who killed your own brother? Now he's evoking Jahiliyyah here. He's evoking Jahiliyyah here, that nobody could stand his tribe being murdered. Now you're saying that you're going to be murdering yourselves. And even if you physically don't kill your own relative, somebody will end up killing. And that somebody is on your side. How can you live in peace in Mecca with this man who killed your own uh, brother? So let us return and let us leave Muhammad and his companions to the rest of the Arabs. And then he gave a very profound point. If they take care of him, if they overcome him, this is what you want. It won't be at our hands. And if it is the other case, meaning he overcomes them, then surely in his izzah is our izzah as well. Meaning, isn't he a Quraysh in the end of the day? And if he wins over, then this is for our good as well. right? And you will have 
an excuse that he will forgive you if he were to ever conquer Mecca. Now imagine, subhanAllah, he's thinking all of these steps ahead. That if Muhammad Sallallahu is successful, then Alhamdulillah, that's what you want for your own tribe, to be successful. And when he comes back to Mecca, you can remind him, look, we didn't fight you that day, so forgive us. Even though he was going to forgive them anyway, as we know. Uh, and if he's not successful, let the Arabs, uh, other Arabs uh, deal with him. So this was when he was on his camel and he was going back and forth. And that is what the Prophet is seeing on the other side. And so he's saying, if they have any good, they will listen to the man on the red camel. This is the parable of the man on the red camel. This is the man who has some uh, sense in him. So, when he's going back and forth, Hakim is so happy that finally this blood money will be paid, that Hakim himself rushes to Abu Jahl. And he says, O oh Abu Jahl, uh, Utbah has agreed to pay the blood money of the Hadrami, and so let us avoid this bloodshed. And so Abu Jahl mocked Hakim, and he said, Oh Hakim, didn't Utbah find any messenger other than you? Meaning messenger means you're a slave now? That you're, you're a servant of, of Utbah now? Didn't he find any slave, any messenger other than you? And so Hakim said, I am not a messenger to him. But this is basically my message as well. Meaning I want this as well. Uh, he, so Abu Jahl is trying to put him down by saying, Are you now a carrier boy? Are you now a telegraph boy? Didn't he find anybody other than you? And so Hakim responds back, Well, if you want to know, I agree with this message. That's why I am here. I want, I want no bloodshed as well. And of course, Hakim is also a noble uh, Qurashi as well. And so uh, when Abu Jahl sees that two or three people are changing their minds, Abu Jahl goes to the blood brother of the Hadrami who was killed. The blood brother, not the extended family. So this is the immediate one. And he says, Will you be happy to take some gold for... Your blood for your for your brother? Have you like no shame that you want to just uh, incite them now or before they change their mind? And so this young man, the Hadrami's brother, the young man stood up and he gave a passionate uh, talk about his brother and the death of his brother and, and how could they uh, basically listen to this. And uh, Abu Jahl at this point then said that, O oh, oh, Utbah, you have become a coward when you have seen the ranks of the Muslims. This is what has caused your mind to, uh, to change. Now this is strange here. Utbah himself said, call me a coward. Right? When Abu Jahl called him a coward, he flipped. Even though he's saying, you call me a coward. I'll, I'll take it. But I guess he didn't want Abu Jahl to call him a coward. Right? Anybody but Abu Jahl. When Abu Jahl called him a coward, he said, uh, and... Uh, uh, this, he sent a bit of a derogatory, uh, derogatory phrase, which I'm not going to translate fully. Uh, but he said to him that, and he didn't speak to him directly, he spoke to him in the third person. He said, this person, meaning Abu Jahl, who perfumes his behind with perfume of women. So he's basically making very derogatory terms uh, about him. He accuses me of being a coward? He shall see who the real coward is. And thus saying, he called his own brother and his own son to march out with him right then and there for the Mubarazah. In other words, he acted emotionally and this led to his death. What is the Mubarazah? We're going to come to the one-on-one -on -one fighting. What is the Mubarazah? That is the one-on-one -on -one fighting. So when Abu Jahl taunted him and said that looking at the army of the Muslims has made you a coward, this made him so enraged, he immediately told uh, his brother and his son, uh, Al-Walid, to come march with him and fight the, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, the Mubarazah 3 to 3, as we're going to uh, come to. Now, uh, notice here as well that the Prophet ﷺ praised the wisdom of Utbah, even though that wisdom was not coming from Islamic ideals. Where was it coming from? Jahiliyyah. Why didn't he want to fight the Muslims? Tribalism. Tribalism. Right? It's not as if he's saying they are upon the truth and we are upon batil, right? He doesn't want to fight because of tribalism. But this ideal of his, of not fighting, is a good ideal. And what he is saying makes a lot of sense. How could you fight your own brother and your own cousin? And then you go home and the murderers of your own brother will be your neighbor. How could you do this? I mean, isn't this common sense, right? And so what we learn here, and it's very relevant for us here in the world that we live in. In the world that we live in, there are people that are defending ideals that might not be coming from Islam. But those ideals 
are good and virtuous in and of themselves. Even if they're not coming from Islam. Whether it is freedom of other people, whether it is uh, the right for the government not to kill its own citizens, you know, whether it is, you get the point here, you know, there's a lot going on in, the, in, in, in America today. And there are many who are supporting causes that are not coming from the Sharia. They're not coming from qala Allahu, qala Rasuluhu. But those causes are causes that are just causes, independent of it coming from the Sharia. It's, they're just causes. No government should kill its own people, ex execute them uh, without any trial. No government should send you know, drones and just f fire upon civilians. And uh, there are many people in these lands that are opposed to these policies. There's nothing wrong with us not just praising them, but getting involved with them, helping them out. Here is the process I'm saying, if there's any wisdom in this whole qawm, it's in that person there. He said it's wisdom. Here's, here, he is saying, if they have any good in them, they'll listen to this man. So, they're idol worshippers, but they still have wisdom. They still have good. And listening to this good will bring about good in them. Right? And therefore, Alhamdulillah, I don't need to preach uh, to you over here, but sometimes uh, there are still people who uh, think that we should not get involved at all in the system. There are still people who say we should have nothing to do with this system because it's all uh, corrupted and faulty. And the fact of the matter is this is really not a very intelligent uh, attitude and is going to cause more long-term damage than uh, good. And so even though uh, his ideals were coming from Jahiliyyah, still because those ideals were good, the Prophet called it wise ideals. And this shows us, and the whole seerah shows this to us, that a person can be good and bad at the same time. A person can be an idol worshipper and still have principles that are worthy of admiration and respect and yes, even support. Now, uh, as the Quraysh themselves are lining up, Abu Jahl stands up and makes a dua to Allah loudly so that everybody hears him. And subhanAllah notice on the one side the process of making dua, on the other side Abu Jahl is making dua. Abu Jahl stands up and makes dua to Allah and he says, and his dua was completely against him even though he did not realize it. He says, O oh Allah, whichever of the two of these armies has brought more evil, and whichever of these two has cut the ties of kinship, and whichever has brought the more unknown doctrines, the more strange ideas, let them meet their death today. And in all three of these counts, Abu Jahl is more guilty than uh, the Prophet So the one who's bringing more evil, the one who's cutting the ties of kinship, SubhanAllah, why are they fighting the Prophet Cutting the ties of kinship, right? The one who's bringing the new doctrine, the Prophet is bringing the doctrines of Ibrahim. He is the original doctrines, the original doctrines of the Arabs was Tawheed. And Abu Jahl is following the newer doctrine, not the oldest doctrine. And so Abu Jahl makes dua against himself. And that is exactly what Allah says in the Quran. In faqad al -fatih. That if you are asking for victory, too late. The victory has already been given basically against you. Right? In tastaftihu. Here's Abu Jahl. You're asking for fatah. Too late now. The fatah has already been decided and it's not going to go to your uh, favor. And the two armies are now facing one another and the Prophet ﷺ issues a command here that certain people should not be killed. He says, certain people should not be killed if you see them. And he mentions in particular Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, his own uncle, Al-Abbas. And he also mentions Abu al-Bukhturi. Abu al-Bukhturi, uh, many things are narrated about him, but uh, one of the major things about Abu al-Bukhturi, he was one of the most important people to break the boycott. The boycott way, way long ago. And, uh, and he mentioned some others and he said all of these people, they are fighting even though they don't want to. They're karihun. They have been forced to fight with the Quraysh and they are not wanting to fight. And this shows us that not all enemies are the same. Even those in an army, some of them are better than others. Even those who are facing the Muslims, uh, intending to kill them. You never know, somebody might not have that intention. Somebody might not have that full. So the Prophet says, and because he knows, because he's Rasulullah, he knows there's Al-Abbas, there's Abu Al-Bukhturi, and there's others who don't need to be uh, killed. Now, we had mentioned that uh, uh, we had mentioned that Utbah started the Mubaraza. What is a Mubaraza? Mubaraza means uh, battle or championship, if you like. Mubaraza is an open bout between uh, specific people. And the way that the Arabs would have a war 
the way that they would have a battle is that before the two armies actually engaged one another, a few people would fight one on one with others. Typically, some of the uh, senior figures, not the actual leader, because that would be too demoralizing for any group, but the second tier, if you like, right? The second rank. They would go out and they would fight one another in order to give some moral victory to one of the two sides, to give them a boost. So this was their st style. It was called a mubaraza. And of course, you rouse up, this is also you rouse up the, the army. You also have a whiff of blood here now that now you see somebody killed and uh, you're supposed to either want to avenge or then if, you, if your side won, then you want to go and uh, attack. And... Uh, it was uh, Utbah who was the one who started the Mubaraza. However, there was an incident that occurred before this. We don't know exactly when. Was Whether it was the night before or whether it was early morning of the 17th, the books of Sirah don't mention. But one person died the first in the whole uh, two armies. And this was uh, Al-Aswad ibn Abd al-Asad al-Makhzumi from the Banu Abd al-Asad uh, from the Makhzum from the Abu Jahl tribe. Al-Aswad ibn Abd al-Asad al-Makhzumi. And when they came to the, 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 the battlefield, and that's why uh, it seems that this happened on the night of the 16th, Allah knows best. Maybe it happened on the Maghrib time or something of the 16th. When they came and they saw that all the water had been uh, cut off, right? So they were expecting water. They were expecting to get some water. When they saw all the water cut off, Al-Aswad said that I will be the one to get some water for you or I will die trying. I'm going to make sure I cross the enemy lines, get some water from one of the wells and bring it back for you. And so uh, he attempted to sneak into the, uh, uh, the side where there were the wells and Hamza uh, saw him and uh, cut, uh, cut off his leg and then killed him before he reached the water. And therefore he was true in what he said, that I will either get water or I shall die trying. Well, he died trying. And so he became the first person to be killed on the Battle of Badr. And that is Al-Aswad ibn Abdul Asad Al-Makhzumi. Allahu alam whether this took place on the 16th night or on the 17th morning, we don't seem to uh, be able to verify. However, the first actual uh, precursor to the Battle of Badr was the actual Mubaraza, and this was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah, his younger brother Shayba ibn al-Rabi'ah, and Utbah's son Al-Walid ibn Utbah. So we have two elderly people, maybe in their early 60s, late 50s type, and this is Utbah and his brother Shayba. So Utbah and Shayba are the brothers. And then Utbah's son, Walid. So Walid ibn Utbah, his father and his uncle. So this is all coming from the core of the Quraysh clan. This is the cream of the Quraysh clan, but this is second tier. Abu Jahl is first tier. Abu Sufyan is first tier. Abu Sufyan, of course, not here at Bal. This is the first tier. Utbah and Shayba, this is basically one level below them. And this was Mubarak is done between these types of people. So they marched forward with their swords to the middle of the ground. And they shouted out, who will come forth and battle us? Who will come forth and battle us? Immediately, three of the Ansar stood up. And they, they were uh, Auf ibn Afra, Mu'awwid ibn Afra, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is the one whom the angels did ghusl of. Uh, on that day, we're going to talk about it in Uhud. Uh, Auf and Mu'awwid ibn Nay Afra, they were the ones who eventually killed Abu Jahl. We'll talk about their story. And they were both very young, probably 17 or 16 years old. And in their eagerness, automatically, they're the ones jumping up. So as soon as... Utbah says, who will battle with us? These three young men of the Ansar. And perhaps the Ansar felt the need to prove themselves over the Quraysh, right? So because they're all from the Ansar, the three of them. They stood up and they said, we will battle you. So Utbah said, who are you? So they said, well, we are so, so and so, so and so and so and so. So Utbah said, we have no battle with you. We have no problem with you. We didn't come to fight you. We don't know you people. Why should we fight you? We are fighting our own blood. Again, they're thinking pure jahiliyyah. They really don't even see the point to fighting the Ansar. Think about that, right? We don't even need to fight you guys. Why are you even here? Go back home, basically. Right? They don't understand the bonds of Iman. They don't understand that Iman is stronger than blood. So they're saying, we don't need to fight you. Go back, send us our own. And then they called out, Utbah called out, O Muhammad Wasallam, send us equals worthy of us. Our blood. Don't send us these Ansar or these uh, uh, Yathribites. Send us some Qurashi. Send us people worthy of us. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ uh, 
was the one who himself assigned the three of them. So he said, stand up, O Ubaidullah ibn al-Harith, and you, O Hamza, and you, O Ali. So he sent three of the core of the uh, Quraysh. And uh, when the three of them stood up, Utbah said, who are you? Uh, so Ubaidah said, this is Ubaidah ibn al-Harith. This is far away, they cannot recognize by, by features, right? This is Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, and Hamza said, Hamza ibn Abdul Talib. Ali said, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so Utbah said, noble, noble adversaries, come and let us fight. This is what we want to fight about. Noble adversaries, come and let us fight. And Ubaidah was the oldest of them. By the way, who, who is this Ubaidah? This was Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib ibn Abdi Manaf, i.e., Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib, not Abd al-Muttalib. Muttalib is the brother of? Muttalib is the brother of? No. No. Abd al-Muttalib is called Abd al-Muttalib because of this guy. Have you forgotten the story? What is Abd al-Muttalib's name? Shayba. Shayba, white hair, Shayba, right? And Abd al-Muttalib, who, who rescued him from his Akhwal in Medina, in Yathrib. Muttalib rescued him. Muttalib brought him back. And when Muttalib entered the city, you're forgetting the story. When Muttalib entered the city, he had a young boy. And he didn't want to tell the people that this is the son of, this is the son of, the son of his brother. He didn't want to tell the people this. Why? Because he was still scared of the Akhwal, the Banu Najjar. He was scared of them. So they said, "Is who is this? Is this your new slave? And he said, yes, this is my new slave. So, Abdul Muttalib became Abdul Muttalib. Otherwise, his name is Shayba. So, Abdul Muttalib is called Abdul Muttalib because of this Muttalib. So, Ubaidah, his grandfather, is that Muttalib. What does that make him of the Prophet? Well, the son of his, his... his father's second cousin. His father's second cousin. Right? And he is the, uh, he is coming from the core. He is, he is uh, coming from the core. Uh, he's not Banu Hashim, by the way. Because Muttalib's brother was Hashim. Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. He's not Banu Hashim. He is Banu Abdi Manaf. Clear? So he's one of the seniors of the Banu Abdi Manaf, not of the Banu Hashim. But still, they're all Quraysh. They're all Quraysh. So he sends Ubaidah ibn al Harith, and he was the eldest. He was the oldest amongst them. And uh, uh, Ubaidah is the oldest, so he automatically goes towards Utbah, and Utbah is the oldest amongst them, right? And uh, Hamza, who is the middle, he goes to Utbah's younger brother, and that is Shayba. So Hamza is the middle age one, and he goes to Shayba, the middle age one, and then of course the two youngsters are Ali on the one hand, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah on the other, right? So automatically, each one goes to somebody who's worthy of the opponent and of course common sense there's no need to by the way some of the books of hadith mention changes around here but this is ibn ishaq's uh, pairing and honestly is the only logical pairing right it's the only logical pairing that each one is by age and this is what we expect is common sense that everyone will find sign find somebody for uh, his own uh, age group and it is said that both Hamza and Ali, the younger of the two, both Hamza and Ali instantaneously pounced on their opponents and they were able to kill them without a single injury to themselves. Details are not mentioned. All we know is that both Hamza and Ali, uh, they exchanged some blows, but no blow was able to come on them and they managed to kill their uh, opponents. And as for, uh, uh, as for Ubaidah, Ubaidah, Utbah managed to slice his leg off. In the battle, he managed to slice his leg off. Ubaidah fell down, and Utbah was about to kill him. But by that time, both Hamza and Ali had finished off the other two. And so they came to the rescue of, uh, of uh, Ubaidah. And so they managed to kill uh, Utbah. And so the father, the son, and the uncle, or the, uh, the brother, if you like, all three of them died. Uh, all because of what? All because of what? Because he was insulted that Abu Jahl called him a coward. Think about how foolish that is. He was insulted that Abu Jahl called him a coward. And subhanAllah, look at Allah's Qadr. These were not the worst of the Quraysh. Neither were they the best. They were not the worst of the Quraysh. But their hamiyyah, their tribalism, their, their what, do you, what do you want to call it? Like it's basically the, the arrogance of just look, my tribe, right? My tribe. Whatever is my tribe, that is what is going to be done. Just because of this. Even though Utbah was not one who wanted to fight. But when your 
morals are not based upon Quran and Sunnah, when your morals are stemming from anything else, even if they have some wisdom, they're also going to have some faults in them. And so in the end, all three lost their lives because of Hamiya, because of uh, overheated, if you like, uh, paganism. And Allah references this in the Quran, according to many tafsir, uh, scholars of tafsir, uh, in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 19. In Surah Al-Hajj, verse 19, Allah says, هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ اِخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ اِخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ These are the two uh, people who are arguing. They're arguing about their Lord. According to the majority of the scholars of tafsir, هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ اِخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ is a revelation regarding these two mubarazas, basically. That one group has one position about their Lord, another group has another position about their Lord. And Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say, that uh, I will be the first person who will, ikhtasamu means they're going to argue in front of their Lord, I will be the first person who will argue on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because I was the one who was the first to kill on Badr and this ayah came down about me. And so this is one interpretation of Surah Al-Hajj verse 19. Surah Al-Hajj verse 19. So the Mubaraz proved to be a big, oh, by the way, Ubaidah uh, was carried on the shoulders of uh, Ali and Hamza, and he died a few days later uh, from the effects of the wounds because his whole leg was cut off and they were not able to stop and cure that or stop the bleeding. And he was old, an elderly man uh, as it is. And so he uh, became an after effect shaheed, not in the battle, not in the battle, but because of the wounds of the battle, he eventually died uh, a few days after this. So this was a big moral boost to the Muslims that it appeared that all three of their people came back safe and all three of the Quraysh had died and of course this was just the, the, the initial victory. This was the appetizer that Allah gave to the Muslims uh, that eventually the whole victory would be theirs. And it is narrated in uh, uh, Sahih Muslim that when the Prophet wasallam was lining up the army, he once again turned to face the Qibla and he raised his hands up to the skies. And he started making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. O oh Allah, fulfill your promise to me. O oh Allah, give me what you have promised. O oh Allah, if this group is destroyed, you shall not be worshipped on earth. The same dua he is making, uh, he was making the last night. And he raised his hands completely to the skies, i.e. not just over here. He raised his hands completely to the skies. And this is one of the three postures that we learn from the Sunnah about how to make dua. The most common posture is to put your hands out like this, straight out like this. This is the most common posture, right? And I have said many, many times, the palms have to be outwards and not inwards. This is the biggest mistake people make is they make it inwards. And you, the Prophet explicitly said, do not ask Allah from the backs of your palms. Ask Allah from the inside of your palms. We don't ask Allah like this. We ask Allah like this. The palms have to be open. This is the most common way. Sometimes the process would make dua by simply raising a finger. By simply raising a finger. Uh, and this is especially for dhikr or istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. He would just raise a finger. So this too is uh, allowed for dua and dhikr. And very rarely, very rarely, he would raise his hands all the way up to the heavens. All the way up. And when you raise your hands up, you don't have your palms facing down. You literally have them facing up like this. So the palms are now facing outwards and up. Not, you cannot do this and go up, right? So he would have his uh, hands upwards and the palms are again out because you always ask Allah with the outward of your palms. So your hands are facing up and you're making uh, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this occasion, it is also allowed to raise your head up to the heavens as well. Otherwise, in salah, you never raise your eyes up. In salah, you never raise your eyes. But at times of extreme problem, extreme distress, then the Prophet would literally raise his head to the heavens and his hands up to the heavens like this, uh, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he kept on making dua and he kept on making uh, dua until so much so that, and he's oblivious to everything around him, that his uh, rida, his upper garment, it falls out. And he is standing there, bare uh, chested, nothing on his chest. He just has his izar, his lower garment on, and his whole chest is open. And he's making dua, and he's oblivious that his rida has fallen down. And so at this, Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, he picked up, he stood down, he stooped down, picked up the izar, and he wrapped it around the Prophet and he hugged him from behind. And he said, enough, Ya Rasulallah, enough. Your Lord will give you as you have promised. 
Your Lord will give you as you have uh, promised. And uh, it was at this time, now subhanAllah over here, we notice a very profound or very beautiful uh, uh, point here. And that is that the Prophet and Abu Bakr are perfecting two different emotions, both of which should be present in the believers. The Prophet is perfecting the emotion of fear. And Abu Bakr is perfecting the emotion of hope. And we have said so many times, hope and fear are both essential. Hope and fear are both essential in the heart of the believer. And you have to have both. And each one has a time where it deserves to be more than the other. At this point in time, the Prophet ﷺ had more fear in his heart that I will, my, my dua will not be accepted. And Abu Bakr had more hope. And at this point in time, even though both are necessary, of course, fear is more appropriate because you're facing the army. Because this is the time where uh, everything will, 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 will be manifested. And so even in this, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, and he is Rasulullah, Abu Bakr is second always. Abu Bakr is manifesting uh, hope. And the Prophet is perfecting the emotion of uh, fear. And so he hugged the Prophet from the back, he put the izar on, he lowered the hands and he said, Enough Ya Rasulullah, your Lord will give you as you have promised. And he had barely said this when the Prophet went into his uh, trance, which means that wahi is coming, right? So literally as soon as he lowers his hands, Allah's response comes, right? And this goes back to the hadith in Abu Dawood that the Prophet ﷺ said that when uh, Allah's servant raises his hands up, Allah is embarrassed that those hands come back without putting something in them, right? Allah is embarrassed. The word used is hayi, shy. Allah is shy. You know, just like when uh, a beggar comes to one of us, he keeps on begging, you just feel shy, come on, you know, let me just give him something, right? And Allah, walillahi mathur al-a'la, to Allah belongs the more perfect example. If any one of us with nobility feels shy when somebody comes and asks and asks and asks, how about Allah Azza wa Jal, how perfect is His nature? And how about His Messenger is doing the asking, right? How about Rasulullah is doing the asking? How can those hands come back without giving him something. So barely has those hands come down, except that Jibreel comes with his wahi. And the wahi, basically he closes his eyes, he appears tense, you can see that wahi is coming. And then when the wahi is lifted, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, he turned around and it was as if his face was the moon. And when, he, when the wahi is now lifted, whatever news is happening, it has made him so happy that is, his face is now like the moon. And he tells Abu Bakr, Abshir ya Abu Bakr. You're telling me to calm down? I'm telling you, be happy. Abshir ya Abu Bakr. For indeed, the help of Allah Azza wa Jal has come. The help of Allah Azza wa Jal has come. This is Jibreel. He's pointing now. This is Jibreel. He has worn his turban and he's holding on to the straps of his horse, guiding it through the uh, valley. And Allah revealed in the Quran that. Uh, 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 that when you ask Allah Azza wa Jal, I shall help you uh, I shall send a thousand uh, angels for your help and one for every one of them. They have a thousand, I'll send a thousand. And one angel could have taken care of all of them. But Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, don't worry. When you are asking for help, I will send down one thousand angels to help you out. And the Prophet ﷺ began reciting سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. This is of course which surah? Surah Al-Qamar. Surah Al-Qamar. Uh, that سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. And uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, when he heard this verse, he said, I never understood this verse until the Prophet ﷺ recited it on the morning of Badr. What does it mean? سَيُهْزَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ dubur. The Groups shall be defeated and they will turn their backs and flee. Sayuhzamul Jamr, the Jamr will be defeated. dubur. They're gonna turn around and run away. Umar said, I used to ask myself, which group is this? Where will they turn their backs? And when the Prophet recited it on the morning of Badr, I knew this group will be defeated and they will turn their backs and they shall uh, flee. And uh Inshallah, the time is, I think we cannot start the next, uh, we'll just mention one thing, that one incident, and then we have to start uh, the details of the particular battles, that the Prophet then stooped down, uh, picked up some rocks and pebbles, 
and he threw it towards the direction of the Quraysh and he said Shahat al Wujuh. Shahat al Wujuh, Shahat al Wujuh. May these faces be cursed. May these faces be cursed and every single person in the army of the Quraysh felt blinded. They got something in their eye. They got something in their nostrils. Even though it was one, uh, one uh, throw that the Prophet ﷺ did and it was literally maybe half a mile or something away. You, could, you know, physically it's not going to go there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it to go to every one of the Quraysh. They were blinded by this. And Allah references this in the Quran. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That when you threw, you did not throw, but Allah threw. It's a beautiful verse, right? When you threw, you did not throw, but Allah threw. In other words, you did throw. But it wasn't you that was throwing. It was Allah who was throwing. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى And every single member of the uh, uh, Quraysh army, they, they felt themselves blinded. They had to cover up themselves. They had to uh, basically clean their nose and their eyes again. And of course, after this, the actual battle began. And inshallah, we will do that بإذن الله تعالى, uh, next Wednesday. And before I open the floor for a uh, question, reminder to myself and all of you, as you all know, uh, that tomorrow is the day of Arafah and insha'Allah ta'ala we should all be fasting on the day of Arafah the Prophet ﷺ gave those blessings of the day of Arafah that he gave to no other day of the year uh, and uh, subhanAllah if Laylatul Qadr has been hidden in the wisdom of Allah the day of Arafah is very crystal clear which one it is and if uh, we have to search for 10 nights for Laylatul Qadr Alhamdulillah we know that the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah where they are and what is the king of these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah and that will be tomorrow and it is authentically narrated that many of the Sahaba and Tabi'un and Taba Tabi'un many many stories that if they were not of course if we were at Hajj then we have a whole different talk to give and may Allah protect those who are at Hajj and accept their du'as and accept their uh, troubles and tribulations and cause them to come back safe and sound and have their sins forgiven and may the people of Hajj remember those who didn't go for Hajj as well insha'Allah ta'ala that's a sincere du'a we make as well uh, so because we are of those who uh, are not at Hajj some of those who would not go to Hajj, it is authentically narrated that they would spend the day of the ninth as much as possible in dua and in dhikr. And one of them said that if I am not there in body, inshallah, I hope to be there in spirit and soul. That uh, today is the day that Allah is giving all of these barakah. And so, if I, and he sp would spend the day in the masjid, this tabi would spend the day in the masjid. And he would say, if I'm not there in my body, inshallah, may my du'as be accepted like their du'as. And we know that, as Imam Malik mentions in Muatta, that never is shaitan more humiliated than he is on the day of Arafah because of what he sees of the mercy of Allah coming down. And so, if this is the case, of course, at Arafah, we are not there still Tomorrow should be a day that we should try our best to have extra dhikr, extra ibadah, uh, extra dua, uh, do what we can to come close to Allah. And of course, most importantly as well is to do the, uh, the, the, the fasting on the day of Arafah. Also, by the way, on the day of Arafah, tomorrow, we begin the takbirat for those who are not in hajj. So we begin the takbirat from the fajr of Arafah. And so after these every salah, we should be saying the takbirat out loud, the takbirat of Eid, the same takbirat of Eid. For the Eid al-Adha, they go on the 9th and the 10th and the 11th and then the 12th Asr time, that is when they stop, right? You should all know this now. 12th Asr is when they stop and then at Maghrib we don't do the takbirat. So uh, we will start the takbirat uh, after every salah. After, even if you're alone when you're in the house, you just say the takbirat after every salah. Uh, from tomorrow, we start on the day of Arafah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, announcement for the Eid, as you all know, is in the Cook Convention Center uh, at 9 a.m. And it's Friday. It's going to be jam-packed. It's a re regular work day. So please... Uh, try to get there by 8.45 or 8.40 or something. It's going to be a long line for parking. You all know that. So we're also going to try to expedite the process, but you know how it goes. We're going to play it by ear. But we understand a lot of people have to go back to work. So we cannot delay Eid too late. That's what I'm trying to say. right? No doubt we're not going to start exactly at 9. But I mean, we're not going to go too late because uh, we have to um, make sure that people get to work. Also, you need volunteers, Baranka, still? or Yes. yes. For and, and so uh, f after Maghrib tomorrow, we're going to have iftar over here, uh, inshallah. Potluck dinner, so don't show up except. <laughs> <laughs> If if you cannot if you cannot bring food bring your duas. 
Just bring your du'as, inshallah. Uh, but it's potluck dinner, so uh, try to think of varieties of dishes, inshallah. And bismillah, let's uh, have iftar here tomorrow. And then uh, from after Maghrib, uh, if you can spare an hour or two, uh, Brother Iqbal needs your help to set up uh, and uh, make the convention center uh, prepared for the Eid Salah, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we have a few questions, inshallah. Bismillah. So the Prophet once had only one time in his life, he had Eid and Jumu'ah on the same day. He had Eid on Jumu'ah. And so he said in Khutbatul Eid that uh, whoever has prayed Eid with us does not need to come for Jumu'ah, but we are having Jumu'ah here, meaning in the masjid. So if a person prays Eid, the fard of Jumu'ah is lifted if he comes, it's good. And the community must have Jumu'ah. So every masjid will have Jumu'ah. The fard of Jumu'ah is lifted. But if he doesn't pray Jumu'ah, he must pray Dhuhr in its place. Okay. So it is not fard to come for Jumu'ah on the day of Eid. If you have prayed Eid, uh, the Eid prayer. Clear? If you okay. And if you pray Jumu'ah, then Alhamdulillah. Okay. Yes. In the preparations for the battle, you know, the decision of the Mubadiza and the lining of Imam up in rows and strategy, how much of a role did uh, Hamza play? I mean, he was experienced in warfare. Did he not have a prominent role or was it all the Sulaat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just so the question is, how much of a role did Hamza play in the uh, assigning of uh, tasks and roles? Again, our big problem is the bulk of these incidents are not mentioned. And believe me, I have scoured the books and tried my best to get as many incidents. And there's also entire dissertations written about Badr and about Uhud and about... So I literally have PhDs and master's dissertations just about every battle, right? So people have spent five years, uh, you know, literally just scouring everything. Uh, and I have, alhamdulillah, most of these dissertations at home. So I go through these and I go... Th and unfortunately, we don't have that many riwayat. I mean, as it is, uh, can you imagine any incident? How much can you record of it? As I have said many times, you know, how much can you actually record of it? So also, when the Prophet system is there, you want to record what he's doing. So we don't really have, I mean, it's amazing we actually have the amount of details we do about what's happening in the side of the Quraysh. It's amazing we actually have this because some of those converted to Islam later on, so they're telling us what happened. It's actually a blessing from Allah that we have what happened. Otherwise, who would know uh, what's happening in the side of the Quraysh? So, sadly, no, we don't know uh, what role Hamza played in, in the preparation. Allah knows best. Yes? The battle of Badr was Ramadan. Fasting was part of that time? Muslims were fasting? La, the, the fardiyya had not yet been revealed. The fardiyya had not yet been revealed. It was just about to be revealed. And this was the uh, the the uh, second year of the Hijrah. And remember, the first year of the Hijrah is when they actually uh, did the Hijrah. Remember, there's no zero. Remember, when in calendars, there's no zero, right? And so, uh, this is like the, f the first full year that is coming upon them. The actual timing of the revelation of, of, uh, of Siyam seems to have been right after the Battle of Badr. It seems to have been. And also remember that uh, the first year of Ramadan, Allah Azza wa Jal allowed those who were able to, to give a fidya every day. Remember this, Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Fidya tuta'amu miskeen. That if you had the money, it wasn't that fard. There was much more lax. Whereas the year after that, فَمَنْ شَاهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ That's when it became. So again, all of the laws came down gradually so Allah knows best we don't have an exact date when the Siyam was revealed we don't have but because of the fact that there's no mention whatsoever of the fasting at this time what people have inferred is that the revelation to fast came down Aqiba means right after the battle of Badr and this fits in perfectly to Surah Al-Baqarah overall that most of Baqarah came down in fact, all of Baqarah came down except for the last ayah, the ayah to Dain and that whatnot. Pretty much all of Baqarah came down the first year and a half after the Hijrah. 
Right? So Baqarah is the earliest Madani revelation. So some of the revelations are right before Badr, such as the change of Qibla, and some of the revelations are, are during a Badr. There's one or two ayat that reference Badr, and then uh, some of them are right after Badr. So we can say that the fasting, Allahu Alam, is right after the incident of Badr. But there's no exact date, so Allah knows best. Any question from the sisters before we break? Okay, final question from the brothers. Okay, Bismillah. We will then. Huh? We want to. <laughs> no problem. You were hesitant to ask. Well, uh, it's 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 actually a complicated issue about the uh, the ability of the Prophet, والسلام, to be a mushtahid or you know in Umur al dunya that he's uh, he can make calls in Umur dunya and he could be wrong, like the hadith of the uh, of the uh, the uh, Balak when he suggested to do something to the Balahan and failed and he said and to Ma'lamu bi umuri dunyakum so that's that's in an umuri dunya now in umur sharia can he be a mushtahid is it possible for him or is that against the uh, so this is a deep question and it's not easy to answer and every madhab has positions about this and this is a topic of usul al-fiqh the question the brother is asking is can the prophet system have a personal opinion in matters of the sharia he clearly can have a personal opinion in matters not related to Sharia. For example, where to put the army. This is a personal opinion in matters not related to the Sharia. Can he have personal opinions in matters related to the Sharia? Uh, the strongest opinion seems to be that Allah Azza wa Jal gave him the authority to have such opinions. And if Allah Azza wa Jal did not want to agree with that position, he then revealed wahi to change it. So, Allah gave him the authority to legislate Sharia upon us. And that authority is binding by Allah's command. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا If you obey him, you will be guided. Right? Examples of this, he changed his mind. Apparently, sometimes not because Allah told him to, but he felt it was okay. And the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal allowed him to do this clearly says and tells us that Rasul Musharri' the Prophet is somebody whom Allah has allowed to propagate Sharia. A classic example of this is uh, is the issue of men visiting graves. Issue of men visiting graves. The Prophet prohibited men from visiting graves. And then he wanted to visit his mother's grave. And so he asked Allah permission. So he initially thought that we should not go to graveyards. This is his own position. And he knows it's his position. And he makes it binding on the ummah. And the ummah follows him. So the only time you enter a graveyard is to bury somebody. You go bury somebody, you get out. That's it. So graveyards are abandoned. Then, then he wanted to visit Amina. And so he asked Allah permission to visit Amina. And Allah gave him permission to visit Amina. And that's the famous hadith. He went and he cried. And then he said that, Kuntu nuhitukum an ziyaratil kubur. Kuntu nahitukum an ziyaratil I used to forbid you from visiting graves. But I wanted to visit my mother Amina's grave. And Allah had allowed me to visit graves. And then he himself was crying so much. So then he said, So go and visit graves because it reminds you of death. So it's as if he himself saw a wisdom in visiting graves. Reminds you of death. And he said, go ahead and visit graves. Right? The key point here is that nobody should say that, well then this means we don't know what is from Allah, what is from the Prophet Because in the end of the day, we don't care. Allah has commanded us to follow the Prophet So if Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with the decision, He would reveal wahi for it. As we know in the case of the prisoners of Badr, for example. Right? If Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with something, He would then reveal something for it. So the fact that Allah does not reveal anything means that whatever the Prophet said that's, that's a is binding. No, but this, the, the point is still there that if Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with any decision, He would reveal wahi. I agree with you, there's no two situations that are exactly the same. But the point being, if the Prophet made ijtihad about anything, and Allah Azza wa Jal did not agree with it for whatever reason, He would intervene and send wahi down.
That's what I'm saying. And so when it comes to the Sharia, everything the Prophet says and tells us to do is Sharia. And we don't care whether Allah specifically told him this ruling or not because Allah chose him to be our Rasul. And Allah chose him to be our role model. And so everything he does and says becomes binding upon us. That's what the purpose of Rasulullah is. That's what, that's what Allah, that is what a messenger is. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا Every messenger has been sent so that he is obeyed by his people. Undisputed obedience, right? Yeah, that's the point. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا Only by giving ita'a to him will you be rightly guided. Okay? That فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Know by your Lord, Allah may qasam by the Rabb of Muhammad. Notice, he didn't have to say وَرَبِّكَ He could have said فَلَا وَاللَّهِ فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ Gave qasam by the Rabb of Muhammad وسلم, to show that relationship, right? لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ They don't have iman. حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Until they take you as their hakam. What does hakam mean? Ultimate judge. Right? About any dispute that they have. حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم ثم لا يجد في أنفسهم حرجا مما قضيت And then they don't have something in their hearts against what you have said. وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا And they submit wholeheartedly. You can't even in your heart feel, why did the Prophet do that? Think about that. So that goes right? against the ishtihad idea. Because the ishtihad idea has a possibility that he might have, he might be wrong. Like, he, I, you, I, I, you didn't hear me clearly. If his ijtihad was not agreed by Allah, what did Allah do? He revealed something. And so, and so, yeah, but in his own lifetime, it's going to come down. That's why the Sharia did go through some fine tuning. In his own lifetime, it's going to come down. And uh, there are many instances of commands being back and forth. Again, I don't want to go into di dispute here, but according to one opinion, uh, muta was forbidden twice and allowed twice. Back and forth and back and forth, right? Another opinion says that lahm al donkeys al bighal that was also forbidden twice and allowed twice. That there is some fine tuning going on, and there are other opinions as well. Sometimes uh, somebody suggested something to the Prophet and Allah Azza wa Jalla reveals something because of that suggestion. Now it's coming from Allah Azza wa Jalla, but the suggestion came from another uh, companion. I mean, classic example is hijab. Umar was the one who said, Ya Rasulullah, shouldn't you know your wives and, and women be wearing the hijab? And Allah Azza wa then revealed, and so Umar used to be proud and say, Wa faqani rabbi, or sorry, Wa faqtu rabbi fi thirath, right? That I agree with my Lord in three things. So you're opening up a door which could be very complicated, but there's no need to. I understand it, it's very easy. <laughs> the bottom line is, whatever the Prophet says is sharia. As long as there's nothing that he himself does that goes against that. That's the bottom line. And this is, all of the fuqaha basically say this. All of the fuqaha. So the issue is more theoretical. Can the Prophet have independent ijtihad? It's theoretical. Even if he did, you have to follow it. And he, do, he did. The strongest position is he did. He has ijtihad. He has ijtihad. Yes, but you, have, you are obliged to follow it. This is the strongest position. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Inshallah, we will continue next Wednesday with the Ta'ala.